Good afternoon, everyone. I'm honored to be joining you from Algonquin Territory in Ottawa, and I want to recognize the different First Nations, Inuit, and Métis territories upon which you are joining us. Today, we're going to be talking about moral courage. Now, moral courage isn't really a value in itself. It's an activator of values. As we all know, it's pretty easy to have values, but the real muster is when they're tested. During times when we are going to have to sacrifice something or maybe get criticized by people who we care about is, or do we have the moral muster to really stand by the values that we hold dear the most? And moral courage is fundamental to reconciliation. And so we're gonna start out talking about what colonialism is, why moral courage is so important, and then Spirit Bear, who's our ambarrister on reconciliation, is gonna take you through a few activities that you yourself can do at home, with your families, or um, in COVID safe ways with your community. So let's go to the next slide. One of the things that's really important to understand is that the closest thing we have in social science to a magic bullet to remedy a lot of the ails that we see, heavy incarceration of certain particular groups, overrepresentation of First Nations children in child welfare, uh, the disproportionate number of people who have poor health outcomes, um, the closest thing we have to a magic bullet for that is addressing inequality. And this is a report that was done by the Pan American Health Organization last year under the leadership of Sir Michael Marmot. And the reason that I point it out to you is that it has a conceptual framework around the questions of equity that pertain particular attention to the disadvantages experienced by Indigenous peoples in the Americas and persons of Afro descent. And what that means is that we need to recognize the land, not just as climate change, which is kind of like a threat to all of us, but more importantly, as something that we are a part of, where memory exists, where identity is rooted, where sustenance comes from. That is a different type of relationship than in the mainstream system under climate change. The other thing it recognizes is the history of colonialism and it's active perpetration today. There's no post-colonial theory in this framework. And the end goal is really to live a dignified life. And of course that dignified life framework comes from the work of the civil rights movement in the United States. So um, I'm just gonna leave that there with you and we'll go to the next slide. Now, what is colonialism? Most think, people think it's a taking of land and of course it is that. But this gen, uh, definition by Eduardo Galeano, who is a Uruguayan journalist, I think really captures the potency of it. It is both visual and it's also about the prisons that it puts on the minds of those who are so affected by it. So what he says is blatant colonialism mutilates you without pretense. It forbids you to talk, it forbids you to act, it forbids you to exist. An invisible colonialism, however, convinces you that serfdom is your destiny and impotence is your nature. It convinces you that it's not possible to speak, not possible to act, and not possible to exist. And so I want you to keep in mind the kind of the more blatant and visual uh, potency of colonialism, as well as that underlying piece. And just be, uh, keep in mind here too, that it, colonialism is often by what we don't see or how we normalize abuses against the rights of indigenous peoples that would not be tolerated for other groups. So let's take an, a, look, a look at an example of that in the next slide. One of the things we're talking a lot about uh, pandemics at the moment, and yet this pandemic is one that very few people in North America talk about. And it was really called the period of the great dying when people from Europe first came over to North America and carried with them diseases uh, into indigenous communities. Now this article, which was published, um, I think two years ago, or in two years ago, was really documents that 90% of the approximately 60.5 million indigenous peoples in the Americas died in the century following 1492. The level of, of death in the indigenous communities was so stark that it actually 
uh, affected climate change. Why? Well, people who are living a subsistence lifestyle and who believed that they were part of the land uh, were replaced by those who saw the land only as a resource available for human extraction. And so they're able to actually show how this unbelievable death rate um, affected climate change. Importantly for Indigenous peoples, though, you can imagine if 90% of your community passed away, how much knowledge and expert uh, uh, expertise would die with those people, and how difficult it would be if you're among the remaining 10% or their descendants. Next slide. Here's another thing. We talk a lot about in the news about the killing of African Americans in the United States by law enforcement, and that is a very important issue to address. But what goes unmentioned is that Native Americans are actually at the highest risk of death by law enforcement. And there's no coverage of it. So again, it's the silencing that happens with colonialism. Let's take another look. Next slide. Now, like in Canada, the federal U.S. government pays for public services on reservations in the United States. The Canadian government pays for all public services on reserves in Canada. And in both countries, the federal government provides far less public service funding to Native Americans in the U.S. or First Nations in Canada than all other Canadians receive. Now we're in the middle of a pandemic, and so I thought it'd be interesting to take a look at what this actually looks like on the ground. So the US government funds healthcare for three populations really, um, the elderly through their Medicaid program, and then uh, federally incarcerated prisoners, uh, US soldiers, of course, on the military, and Native Americans through the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And what you can see here is there's huge differences even in how uh, the federal government funds healthcare, where federally incarcerated prisoners receive $6,973 per capita US, according to a 2016 study. And Native Americans though, get $1,297 from the federal government per capita. So you can see here that there's a lower valuation of the lives of Native Americans. In Canada, there are similar discrepancies, which we'll turn to in a minute. Now, what does this mean in the pandemic? We're just gonna look at the Navajo Nation. Um, the Navajo Nation, 30% of Navajo Nation members have no water on their reservation. Nearly half of them are below the poverty line. And it's no surprise if you think about not having water, underfunded education, underfunded, um, services of all ilks, uh, that they would find it much more difficult to kind of succeed uh, than other Americans. They also have the highest rate of COVID of any group in the United States. They are above the rate per capita of New York and New Jersey. So we can see these pandemics really feed off of the existing inequalities and really how rarely it is that Native Americans are really even dialogued about in the whole COVID epidemic that's happening in the United States. So we'll go to the next slide. So what I wanna say about Canada is sometimes it's easier to look abroad and think about apartheid South Africa as being egregious or the discrimination against African Americans in the United States during the civil rights movement, or even as we see today, it's ongoing uh, problems. But we don't often think about Canada actually being the perpetrator of human rights abuses. And one of the things that is continues to be true is that the Canadian government underfunds public services for First Nations on reserves. Now, notice I'm not using the word indigenous. I actually uh, have, uh, would caution you against using it because this type of funding inequality does not apply in the same way to Inuit or to Métis. Their services are funded through territorial or provincial governments. So we're talking strictly about First Nations. But what we can see is a pattern where the government of Canada knew about the inequalities, they had solutions to address them, and they chose, that's the important language, they chose not to address them, going back as early as 1895. So the fact that these inequalities continue to exist that put First Nations at higher risk for COVID and other types of uh, social, economic, and educational poor outcomes 
is not a surprise. It is a choice of a negligent government. So we're going to take a closer look at that next. Now, sometimes you'll hear with land claims, you'll think, oh my gosh, you know, well, these the First Nations want more than their share of the land. Well, in 1491, First Nations in Canada had 100% of the lands we now know as Canada. Um, but just to put it in perspective, in 2020, First Nations only have 0.02% of the land. So when you see news coverage that suggests that First Nations are somehow being more greedy or taking more than their share, it's really important to know this particular piece. And that when colonialism happened, it often displaced First Nations and put them on some terrible lands. That's why we see so many times flooding from Kakeshawan. It's not where the community would have normally lived, it's where Canada put them on. So it could take the other lands that had more resources and were for better for sustainable living for the country of Canada itself. Next slide. Now, this is one of my greatest heroes. Actually, this past weekend, I spent at Beechwood Cemetery sprucing up his burial site. His name is Peter Henderson Bryce, and he was a federal official in the Department of Indian Affairs, the medical health officer then, in 1904. Prior to that, he was uh, Ontario's chief medical health officer and the president of the American Public Health Association. So widely thought to be one of the top medical professionals of his day. So what does Bryce have to do with COVID? Well, um, in 1904, he was sent out by the Canadian government to look at the health of kids in residential schools. And what he found is that the children were dying at a rate of 24% a year. And if you map them over three years, about half of the children would be dead. The reasons for it was tuberculosis. Now you would say, well, non-Indigenous people were dying of TB back then. And you would be right about that, but not at these rates. So what was driving this disproportionate rate? Well, Bryce found that for the people living here in Ottawa, they were getting three times as much healthcare funding in this one city than all First Nations were across Canada. So he said to the Canadian government, you need to equalize out the healthcare funding and then implement some practical reforms. And these will sound very familiar to those of you who are social distancing right now. He said, don't put sick kids in with healthy kids. Ventilate the buildings so that the disease doesn't propagate. Make sure that the children are, are well nourished. Improve the sanitation of these schools. And make sure that, you know, children have access to good nourishment so they're less prone to and susceptible to it. The cost of Dr. Bryce's reforms when they came forward in a report to the federal government in 1907 was about ten dollars to $50,000. That's a lot of money, you might be thinking, and it was back then, but not in terms of the whole Canadian budget. The Canadian budget back in the day was about 100 million. So you can see 10 to 15,000 was really a drop in the bucket. Um, but the Canadian government said, no, we're not gonna spend it. And it, uh, Bryce's report gets leaked to the Ottawa Citizen. This is actually a picture of the Ottawa Citizen. It was then called the Evening Citizen. And right on the front page of not only this newspaper, but editors put it on the front page of many newspapers going as far west as the Victoria Colonist, we see this headline, Schools Aid White Plague. Absolute inattention to the bare necessities of health. Now, no one knows for sure who leaked it, but everyone thinks it was Dr. Bryce himself, and so did the Canadian government. And the Canadian government persecuted Dr. Bryce, cut all of his research funding, uh, really said he was insubordinate, tried to disparage him in his professional reputation. But one of the lawyers who read the headline said was a guy named Samuel Hume Blake, uh, who was the co-founder of Blake's law firm, and he would be later became a judge. So he knew criminal law quite well. And he said, in that Canada fails to obviate the preventable causes of death, it brings itself into unpleasant nearness with the charge of manslaughter. So this is a reminder where Canada knew better. It had the solutions based in science from an expert in his field. And instead, it chose not to do better. And people of that period thought that Canada's conduct was not only likely immoral, it's quite possibly illegal. Next slide. Now, 
Bryce and Mr. Blake were not the only ones blowing the whistle. Children themselves were blowing the whistle. And uh, Dr. Bryce uh, continued his advocacy for these children. And eventually in 1922, a year before Edward B. would pen this letter, he writes a pamphlet called A National Crime, which he circulates all over Ottawa with the correspondence to the various government officials about what needed to be remedied. And you can see here, this is a little Edward B. It's written in the Christmas season of 1923, so about one year after Dr. Bryce's National Crime Report is circulated. And he's writing uh, to parents. So uh, we don't know if it ever reached his parent, but we do know it did get to someone important. And what he's talking about here is always being hungry. Remember Dr. Bryce said, don't make sure the children are well fed, they'll be less prone to disease. And that children were running away, they were so hungry. They're so hungry, they're eating cats and they're eating wheat. And some of the boys cried because they were hungry and they were also being hurt. Now, this letter, likely didn't get to Edward B's parents, but it did get to Duncan Campbell Scott, the leading official on the residential school file, who in response to this letter says 99% of the kids in residential school are too fat anyway. And then he tosses the letter into the bin. Next slide. So this is the man who said no. Um, he uh, was on the residential school file for, for 52 years. He uh, served under numerous prime ministers, including Prime Minister Laurier, who's often lauded for his respect for diversity, being the first Francophone uh, Prime Minister of Canada. But he certainly did not have progressive views about First Nations. Um, he was uh, served as the president of the Royal Society of Canada between 1921 and 22, right when Bryce's report was circulating. But there's no record in the, in the Royal Society records of anyone saying, hey, you know, like, have you heard what our president is alleged to have done? He also won a bunch of medals and he got an honorary doctorate for his work primarily in poetry. He's considered to be a Confederate poet. So some of you might have met him in your high school uh, poetry classes. And it's interesting here, we have Dr. Bryce with moral courage that we talked about earlier, that ability to speak the right thing, even if you take a personal or professional risk. And he got persecuted for that and eventually written out of the Canadian history books. Whereas Dr. Scott, Duncan Campbell Scott, gets promoted in Canadian history the Canadian government holds a big reception for him. And so he really is rewarded for moral cowardice in his long career. And in fact, in the closest thing to a lament, um, in John Malloy's book, A National Crime, which takes its title from Bryce's report, and I really recommend you all read it, uh, he notes that the closest thing to a lament, Scott, in fact, says um, uh, in a letter to his editor, I have never done anything courageous in my entire life. That's the closest thing to a lament we have from him. Next, next slide, please. So when the, the Murder Missing Indigenous Women and Girls report came out, we had this big controversy in the news about whether it was genocide or not. And um, I was kind of surprised at the fervor of it and the willingness of many people who are otherwise very thoughtful to quickly dismiss that, no, it's not genocide. Um, they said it had to be intentional. There was no intention to kill all these kids in residential school. And I don't think that's right. I think the historical record actually points to the fact that Canada made very deliberate decisions. And um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission found that approximately four to 6,000 children died um, in residential schools and many more suffered profound maltreatment. And at the side here, I just wanna show you these pictures of children these are actually, part, uh, this was in the White Horse Star newspaper in 2015. These are actually children that likely would have been saved had Dr. Bryce's report been implemented, but sadly they all did die at a very young age. And so it really shows the human dimension and the human tragedy of this whole situation. Another thing I just wanna underscore is here's a quote from Duncan Campbell Scott in 1910 where he says, it is readily acknowledged that Indian children lose their natural resistance to illness by habituating so closely in these schools and that they die at a much higher rate than in their villages. 
but this alone does not justify a change in the policy of the department, which is being geared towards the final solution of the Indian problem. Of course, the final solution would raise again as another horrendous phrase during the Nazi era. But, and although, you know, you can argue about scale, I think it's difficult to get away from the idea that the final solution in both cases had at their ends the elimination of a particular population. Next slide. Now, this is another one we're going to go forward and just see how this theme is picked up over history. And uh, this is a report by Mary Twig Wynn Woodward. And uh, she is getting her master's of social work degree. And this is her paper on uh, juvenile delinquency among Indian kids, uh, particularly Indian girls. And it's done in 1949. And uh, what she writes there is the conclusion is drawn that the fate of these Indian girls must promote greater awareness of the part social work could play in helping other Indian children. The conditions under which the Indians live are a discredit to Canadian welfare standards. So in here, she talks about the inequitable services, the same theme. She picks up that thread from Bryce and brings it forward to 1949. So again, within a profession, within the university specter, there were these people who were speaking out at different times. Next slide. This is a 1946 submission uh, by the Canadian Association of Social Workers and the Canadian Welfare Council. And uh, it again raises these inequitable public services on reserves. And although the, neither group advocated for the closure of residential schools and were both in favor of assimilation, they did note the pervasive ills caused by the inequitable services and relevant to child welfare. They spoke about how those underlying inequalities were resulting in more Indian children being placed in residential schools under the banner of child welfare. And that's what a lot of people don't really kind of get is that residential schools were two things. One is you could be removed for quote education, which we all know was assimilation, or because you were quote not properly cared for. And that judgment of not properly cared for was made by under Eurocentric standards. So by the 1960s, about 80% of the kids in residential schools were placed there under child welfare placement. So it's important to know that. Next slide. And this brings us to 1967. Yeah, of course, was Canada's 100th anniversary and a report by George Caldwell. And it was done for the government of Canada itself. It was commissioned and paid for by the government of Canada, Indian Northern Affairs. And you can see here that he studies um, children in residential schools in Saskatchewan. And what he found, again, here is this 80% of admissions were to do with child welfare reasons. And he goes and makes this recommendation, is that the agency will need to direct more resources and energy into services for their children in their own homes and where alternative care is required, homes in the Indian community should be helped to provide this service. This was over 50 years ago, 53 years ago, to be honest. And um, this is the same kind of recommendation that we're gonna be seeing coming forward. Let's uh, go to the next slide. Now this is 1996. Uh, some of you will remember the uh, Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. Uh, it was co-chaired by Justice Dussault and of course the great George Erasmus. And uh, there were many, many interviews and, re and resource studies. And the whole idea behind this thing was to get away from the Indian Act and set out a, a 10 year plan or a 20 year plan um, to really affirm First Nations, Métis and Inuit rights and uh, reset the society on a proper vision. They took some attention to the issue of kids and child welfare. And as you can see here, by this time, we had First Nations child welfare agencies operating. But the federal government required them to take on provincial laws and use those laws, even though they hadn't proven that effective for First Nations. And the second is, they were only going to get funding under the federal government. And it was to a far lesser standard than what mainstream agencies had, even though the First Nations population had greater needs owing to residential schools. Remember, 1996 is the year the last residential school closed in Canada. 
And they paid particular attention, picking up on Caldwell's thread and the threads from Dr. Bryce, is that there needed to be substantially equal services and that attention needed to be provided to preventing kids from going into the child welfare system. Next slide. Then I come along into the picture, along with many others, and join into the work. And in 1997, we worked with the federal government, along with the Assembly of First Nations, to document the inequalities in child welfare, but more importantly, to come up with solutions. And you can see that report was published in June of 2000 on the left-hand side of your screen. And it found that First Nations kids were getting 78 cents on the dollar in child welfare funding. But stack on top of that, the fact that, many, that one in six First Nations had no clean water, like we saw in the Navajo situation. We had inequities in education. We had inequities in sanitation. We had inequities in healthcare. So all of this created a perfect storm for higher needs in child welfare and more disadvantaged to family, and yet they were getting less. So there were recommendations for change. Canada welcomed the report, as it had with RCAP and other reports, and then did nothing. It, other than to ask for another report, which we did in more detail. That report, the Wande series, came out in 2005. It found that, in fact, the shortfall was bigger than 78 cents by then. It was about 70 cents on the dollar, and the key area, just as Caldwell noted it in 1967, was in the lack of supports for families. And um, Canada, again, wrote us a nice, nice letter, but didn't do anything. So that brought us to a point of like, what are we going to do about it? How courageous, morally courageous are we going to be in holding Canada accountable? It was quite possible that if we did another study, they would fund us well as an organization. But our, our, our commitment was to the children. And so we had to do something about it. Next slide. So we filed a human rights complaint against the government of Canada in 2007, along with the Assembly of First Nations. We alleged that Canada was providing inequitable public services to kids in child welfare and in other public services by not implementing something called Jordan's Principle. And put very simply, Jordan's Principle says, First Nations kids should be able to access public services they need when they need them, free of any discrimination relating to their First Nation status. Canada actually adopted Jordan's Principle in the House of Commons, but then never implemented it. Their claim was there was no Jordan's Principle cases. But I wanna show you what was actually in their records and that we filed at the tribunal. Uh, Canada fought it tooth and nail on procedural grounds. So we were able to see how their documents in the background, what they actually knew. So you can see here on November 29, 2012, there's a four-year-old little girl who suffers cardiac arrest and requires assistance in daily living. She requires a hospital bed and a mattress so she can go home for Christmas. And her mom is actually pregnant and due to have another baby in a, in a month. Now, Canada gets this request for a hospital bed so this child would be able to breathe properly and not prematurely suffocate. And their response after going through 15 different public servants is absolutely not. A doctor in the hospital with a heart bigger than a Canadian government funded the bed so that little girl can go home. Next slide. Now, you might say, well, you know, that was just a what off. But here's some evidence is that in 2000, that's Jordan River Anderson, the founder of Jordan's Principle on the right hand side. Um, in 2011, the federal government actually provided the highest award to the public servants who had made sure that there were no Jordan's principal cases, who had said no to that four-year-old little girl and many others like her. And uh, they gave them the Deputy Minister's Recognition Award. It was under the leadership of then Deputy Minister Michael Wernick, which some of you may remember uh, then goes on to be the Privy Council Clerk over at the Department of Indian Affairs. So what this shows is that discrimination was not just normative in the Department of Indian Affairs, it was award winning. Next slide. In 2016, the tribunal issued its decision. It found that Canada was discriminating against 165,000 children. And it found the similarities in Canada's response to the, the whistleblowers like Bryce and residential schools. 
up till today, very similar, is that the Canadian government had not learned from residential schools. It had not learned sufficiently from the 60s scoop. Those old ways of thinking that have perpetuated the discrimination were still alive and well. And the Canadian government was ordered to stop its discrimination. Next slide. Now, it took 10 non-compliance orders and still counting for Canada to begin to make progress. But in September of last year, the panel found that even this is three years after the three and a half years after the original decision that Canada was still willfully and recklessly discriminating against children. It knew better and it did not do better for these kids. The tribunal ordered that Canada pay compensation to these children and their families in the amount of $40,000 each, which is the maximum allowable under the act. Canada then appealed that decision. Next, uh, next slide. So um, this is uh, the department. They said, you know, they're out of patience, um, that they, uh, they were making statements that they were going to pay the compensation, but then they filed their legal papers saying they wanted to quash all the compensation. And this out of patience thing is interesting because I hear it a lot from government. You know, First Nations need to be patient. Uh, you need to be, we're working really hard. We're doing good first steps. But keep in mind, thinking about the, those arguments, those excuses, in the context of the evidence I've just shown, there really is no excuse for perpetuating racial discrimination as public policy, particularly regarding children. Next slide. So this brings me to the Spirit Bear plan. So Spirit Bear is our reconciliation and barrister. You can see him there. And we really have a plan to remedy all of these problems that Bryce pointed to. So the first is uh, the part of the Spirit Bear plan is for Canada to observe fully all of the orders of the Canadian Rights Tribunal. Um, the second is for the parliamentary budget officer to cost out all the areas of inequality, water, housing, healthcare, juvenile justice, child welfare, let's see what the big ticket is. And then create something like the Marshall Plan to remedy those things. The second part is to create, is to do a 360 evaluation of the department. To get those ways, to make, to identify those things that get in the way of the department doing better when it knows better. Because we cannot continue to allow it to be a repeat offender against First Nations kids. This is the same department that did residential schools, the same department that did 60 Scoop, and the same department that's been found to be willfully and recklessly uh, discriminating against kids in ways that unnecessarily separate families and in some cases, sadly, results in the deaths of kids. That's as of 2019. Next slide. So Canada hasn't developed the spirit, won't adopt the spirit bear plan. And I think what we've seen with the monies coming forward with COVID, although they're very welcome and needed, is it was always possible for Canada to remedy these inequalities. They simply chose not to do it. They thought it, that's where that shows you how deeply embedded it is in the DNA of the, of the government. So we've created these campaigns where we invite caring Canadians like you to become involved in remedying those inequalities. Because we've come to believe that although there are good people in government, governments don't create change, they respond to change. And we've adapted all these campaigns so that they're COVID friendly and they can be done by anyone of any age. In fact, children have been some of the best learners on this. When they see these inequalities, they don't make excuses for them and they want to be part of, of helping address them in a loving way. So we have this whole thing on hibernating for health on Spirit Bear, and I'll show you a couple of those activities. Let's go to the next slide. So one of the things you can do is in memory of all those children who died in residential schools, you can make a little heart and create a heart garden and, uh, or plant flowers in memory of those children. And the art of planting is your commitment to the TRC's 94 calls to action to really address the structural issues that led to residential schools and to prevent them from recurring and also dealing with the fallout from them. So um, we also have a child-friendly version of the TRC's calls to action, which you can find free of charge on our website. So next slide, please. Now the best people to explain what these campaigns are all about are kids themselves. So let's watch this very quick video of children explaining it. The reconciliation is 
is not one event. It's, it's a series of events. It's, it's a continuation of this dialogue that we've been having in our country. Reconciliation really means mending the bonds between what our ancestors did to the indigenous peoples of the land and all the horrible things they endured. It's a way of saying sorry, but doing more than that. It's a way of um, communicating and creating meaningful bonds. I think a project like this is super important because it involves young people, and I think that young people are the ones that are going to move Canada in a better and stronger direction. Celebrated in May and June, honoring memories, planting dreams, invites people of all ages and backgrounds to show their commitment to reconciliation by planting heart gardens in their communities. Each heart represents the memory of a child lost to the residential school system. And the act of planting represents your commitment to honoring the legacy of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and its calls to action. Thousands of heart gardens have been planted across the country by schools, faith groups, organizations, families, children, and caring individuals. Register your garden online today at honoringmemoriesplantingdreams.ca Because reconciliation means not saying sorry twice. So you can see here that everyone can make a difference. Um, just to say that you can go to Beechwood Cemetery too and you can find Dr. Bryce buried there along with Duncan Campbell Scott who's actually just over the hill and Nicholas Flood Davin who wrote the report for John A. Macdonald that sparked residential schools. What we're trying to do there is tell a balanced telling of history. That's not to make them out as all bad people because they did do some good things but it's to make them instructive teachers for this generation of children. And uh, we've actually created this uh, work with Project of Heart and put this in elementary schools too, so it's pretty exciting. Next slide. Now there's all the tribunal citations. You can see we've been up to the Federal Court of Appeal, but for those of you who are legal beagles and you're interested, you can go on to fnwitness.ca and read all about this case. Next, uh, next slide, please. And most importantly, all of you can find seven free ways to make a difference that are COVID friendly, that won't cost you a penny on our website. And there's all kinds of learning resources there that'll teach you about things like Jordan's principle or about the wonderful Shannon Kustachin who advocates for, uh, advocated for equitable education. Um, all of these stories are there, including the ones about Dr. Bryce under our reconciliation, uh, reconciling history tab. And so you can learn about him too. Next slide. So that can, kind of concludes what I wanted to share today. I wanted to share how throughout history we've had multiple opportunities to remedy these inequalities. We've had the solutions. It's just up to all of us to make sure that the government implements them. One of the things I would say is, you know, um, by with Dr. Bryce, Beechwood Cemetery, which is Canada's national cemetery, has been so fantastic about really embracing the opportunity to learn from these historical figures. Um, and uh, we, um, when I first went to see Dr. Bryce's grave, it was actually the day before Prime Minister Harper apologized for residential schools. And I brought with me a bright a bouquet of brightly colored Gerber daisies to represent the joy of all the children he tried to save. I went there to thank him, but I also was mindful that he filed his report in 1907 and we filed the legal case against the Canadian government exactly 100 years later in 2007. So I wanted to thank him for the example that he set. And I told him I would be back when the kids won the case. And indeed, in 2016, before the world ever heard about the decision, I went back to Beechwood Cemetery. And alone in the cemetery, uh, Spirit Bear, the, uh, our barrister and I read Dr. Bryce the decision. So it's really important that we learn from history. I think Canadians have, a, have not been gifted with the history that they need to know to make informed decisions about the contemporary injustices. Thanks, Cindy. So we have just two minutes left in the session, but we have a question uh, from Natan. What shortcomings do you see in Canada's current SDG plan in addressing reconciliation and decolonization? I don't think that they really take it seriously in terms of developing one with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit that is um, really focused on the SDGs with measurable investments, with measurable uh, and public accountable outcomes. Um, it's not enough to put a poster up 
which Canada frequently does. We support the SDGs, we support the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, while it continues to perpetuate this kind of discrimination. So it's really vital that they adopt the Spirit Bear Plan, that they implement the SDGs, and that they do that with investments in the budget that are predictable and adequate and sustained. Thank you, Cindy, for your response. That is the end of our session this morning. For the audience, um, if you'd like to visit the schedule, there is an opportunity to join a Zoom meeting to connect face-to-face -face with other people who were here in attendance to discuss uh, Cindy's keynote. Um, and yeah, thank you. And I can just imagine everyone, you know, generating their enthusiasm and applause out from their homes because we so appreciate you taking the time today, Cindy, to talk with us about moral courage and the Spirit Bear Plan. Well, and you know what? Um, there's so many moral hero courage examples coming out from Dr. Bright in the United States to people in their everyday neighborhoods during COVID who are, are doing the right thing. So I know we can do it. Uh, we just have to show the government that uh, we know these inequalities exist and we're not going to make the same mistake twice. Not, not this time. We know better and we're going to do better. All the best to all of you.